Thank you for listening to the Keto Answers Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Anthony Gustin, and joining me this week is Jonathan Baylor. Jonathan is best known for his New York Times best-selling book, The Calorie Myth, and we dig into all that stuff about why we both think that it's ridiculous to have to count calories down to the you know, 5, 10, 10, 20, 30 calorie increment, and he has a new book coming out called The Set Point Diet. Um, which simplifies a lot of stuff with nutrition. So he actually said a few things in this podcast that blew my mind that I'm stealing that were just super easy things to remember about what you should or should not eat. So get your pen and paper out. You're going to take some notes on this one. It's awesome. Uh, Simple rules that you can give your friends and family. And so without further ado, my episode with Jonathan Baylor. Before we get to the episode, I wanted to chat about our sponsor, Perfect Keto. Perfect Keto is all about making a ketogenic diet healthy and accessible. Whether you're reading all of our online guides or articles or enjoying Perfect Keto's exogenous ketones or any other keto-friendly products, everything you need to make keto work for you is at perfectketo.com. I know what you're thinking. Hey, aren't you the founder of Perfect Keto? Yep, that's right. And all of my insanely high standards have been put into making each and every product. My background as a functional medicine clinician helps me craft the cleanest and healthiest possible products and the best information about the ketogenic diet. Head on over to perfectketo.com to learn anything you need to know about the ketogenic diet. And if you've never tried any of our products before, feel free to use the code Keto Podcast for 20% off your first order. With that being said, let's get into the show. All right, Jonathan Baylor, thank you for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. All right, so you are known for quite a few things, but I think the, probably the, the most known is the calorie myth. So maybe for people who aren't familiar with this, maybe you just kind of back up a little bit and chat about the process of that, what that is uh, as far as the book, and maybe give a little background uh, regarding that. The calorie myth is the title of my first uh, major publisher published book. My first book book was called The Smarter Science of Slim, and that evolved into the calorie myth. And the But the what is the calorie myth more than a book? It is not, to be very clear for all the it fits your macros people out there, that calories are a myth. So so calories exist and they matter. Clearly, they're not like unicorns. Uh, However, the myth is that calories are the thing that we should focus on in order to improve our health and reduce our weight. That is the myth. And you could even take it further and say that the myth is that we need to consciously count calories or even think about calories or even know what the heck a calorie is in order to live our best lives. That is the myth. This is something that I've had a stance on for a very long period of time and I've gotten blasted for it many a time. Um, actually, if like I don't know, it was like four or five years ago, I wrote a post on my website and I don't know if you know who Lyle McDonald is. Um, yeah, I think he's probably good friends with uh, Anthony Al Alanon or Al whatever the heck. Those uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know, but he um he he brought he trolled my page and brought a whole bunch of uh, trolls with him, um, really aggressively blasting me for having this oppor- like like just writing a post saying that hey we should probably be thinking about other things than just strictly a calculation upon if calories exist or not. And I think the stance I took in that post is a little aggressive, but it was like if you keep thinking that this is the case and you actually do the math you will eventually just keep decreasing calories until like, you literally don't exist. And to not have some sort of an awareness that we have a lot of other machinery that's going on, like we're not just a bomb calorimeter. We don't just put one thing in one end and then burn fuel. Like There's a lot of other processes happening. Um, and the just complete uh, ignorance of that uh, on a lot of people's part is just, it's, uh, it still continues to be a little confusing to me. Um, so like you said, most people think that you eat some calories, you, you, you know, X amount of calories, and if you burn Y amount, and that Y amount is less than you gain fat, and if it's more, then you lose fat. And clearly, there's a little bit more to this this um, equation. So, I mean, just uh, your kind of elevator pitch on on why that's not the stance that you take. So, let me say two things. One is I, I too can empathize with the uh, with the trolls. A- anger and aggression <laughs> that people uh, come at it with, and I think just to you know try to be empathetic and, and understand where they're coming from. You know, there are, I mean, there is a long history of, I mean, you go back to the 1950s and Dr. Taller wrote a book that said that the title was Calories Don't Count. So there, there are people, to be very clear, who would assert that if you eat 9,000 calories of butter, 
because it doesn't cause a release of insulin that you won't gain fat. And to those people, I would say I can get why the Lyle McDonald's of the world are just like, you guys are spouting myths that are dangerous and you're going to cause people to become obese because that is just biologically false. And it is biologically totally. false. If you eat 9,000 calories of olive oil, you will absolutely gain fat, period. So I think, I mean, that's important. And I don't think you're refuting that. And I am definitely not refuting that. My fundamental elevator pitch is the following. And this is actually not from me. I'm borrowing it from someone else. and I forget their name. Calories count, but you can't have to count them. And the simple explanation for that is if you had to count calories in order to be healthy, we would have all been sick and fat for the entirety of human history up until a couple years ago because we know what the hell calories were. So it can't be required. I mean, we don't have to consciously monitor milligrams of vitamin C in and milligrams of vitamin C out or niacin or essential amino acids. So why would, because I, I think it's interesting to think of a calorie as an essential nutrient because the definition of an essential nutrient is something your body cannot create. And if you don't consume it, you die. So by that definition, a, a calorie or a unit of energy, your body cannot produce its own energy. So therefore, if you do not consume energy, you will die. Why would it be that for this one essential, quote unquote, essential nutrient, we must consciously monitor them in and out, but every other essential nutrient doesn't work that way. So I think if people could just like kind of calm down for a second and say, <laughs> of course, calories exist, that's fine. But we have evolved past the very uh, second grade level of nutritional understanding, which is like, oh, 500 calories of, of Mountain Dew does the same thing to you as 500 calories of spinach and salmon because that that is equally ignorant as saying 9,000 calories of olive oil won't make you fat. Right, and I think that one of the one of the really simple ways that I kind of explain this to people is like like you said, yes, the amount of energy that you input does matter, but not to the extent that like that's something that you have to track every single time. So like if you were to drive a car that should be running on gasoline um, and you go out and you expect it to have the same miles per gallon every, every place you drive it, no matter how you drive it or in, under what conditions, like no one would expect that. And I think the same thing should be expected of the human body that the amount of energy you put in it, yes, you can overfill the gas tank, but how you drive it matters. How it performs matters. Like if, if your car is missing two wheels, you're not going to get the same amount of miles per gallon out of it. And to your point about Mountain Dew versus olive oil and spinach and salmon, I think that one of the things as well is that people don't realize that Mountain Dew is not a fuel that fuels human bodies. Like, let's let's take, take a step back. If we put oil into a gas tank of a car, like, would you really expect it to run that well? Would it like like there, there's a giant problem there with how the machinery is designed to run? And what it's running on. And, and I think that you have a pretty strong stance in food quality as well. 100%. And like, let's go, let's take it another direction too. To say that calories are the only thing that matters, one of the other reasons that that is just patently false is there are plenty of things that have no calories where there is no debate that they have an impact on the metabolism. So nobody questions that insulin therapy causes an increase in fat storage, but insulin doesn't contain calories. Nobody questions that SSRIs have an impact on your metabolism, but when you, they don't contain calories. So to say that energy is the only thing that has anything to do with the metabolism right. is, is just patently false. Or, or caffeine, another very well studied um, compound that again, not calorie containing, but huge effect on metabolism. Sure. Or, uh, let's anabolic steroids don't contain calories. Sure. Do affect your right. muscle and fat composition. Right. Oh yeah. Interesting. Uh, I just don't like, this is where we have some simple, simple facts that, I mean, it's, it's tough. I think when you, when you don't really nerd out on some of the science, like I'm sure 
both of us have spent many, many, many hours looking into this type of stuff and like really truly understanding it of frankly being confused. And so obviously when it comes down to things that what, what I think, like you said, well, why, why recently, why in these last, you know, few dozen or hundred years, whatever you want to, however you far you want to extend it is only now that we have to look at and search. And I think that there's a few different things to this. One, um, the food, the food we're eating, the food quality we're eating. So like I said, we're just putting the wrong fuels into our body. And so, I mean, how do you approach things from, I would say a step-by-step approach of someone who doesn't, doesn't get this, doesn't get what the hell we're talking about, doesn't know if it's right to count calories or not, but just wants an approach that they can move forward with to be healthy and, and lose fat and to, and to be the best version of themselves. So the, the thing that you really want to watch out for, and the reason that calories have become so popular is because they give processed food manufacturers a free pass. Because if we stop talking about food and mm. start talking about calories, you can literally go into the Cheesecake Factory or McDonald's and their their healthy choices are smaller portions of garbage that all can, right. like as long as they're fewer than 400 calories, they're healthy choices. But like that, I mean, so I, I own a company and we sell products and it still baffles me that, you know, uh, I could just shrink the serving size of the product that I'm selling you, charge you more for it, cause, call it healthy because it has fewer calories. Like, it, the food industry has has figured out a way through calorie manipulation to convince people to pay more for less. And then we get, you know, again, the same kind of thing with like frosted flakes with, with little kids. If it's just about calories, then it's fine to eat garbage because then you can just get out and, and exercise and cancel out those frosted flakes and cancel out that Mountain Dew. So I can build a thriving fitness industry and I can build a thriving processed food industry if I can convince you that all that matters are calories because one, the quality of your food doesn't matter because it's all about calories. And two, the quality of your food doesn't matter because you can just exercise the calories off. What a trap, huh? It's absolutely a trap. And it's absolutely why we now face the most catastrophic health epidemic the world has ever seen. And that is the diabetes epidemic that is literally killing more people, than heart disease, cancer, terrorism combined. It's devastating. So what is the, I mean, what is the cause of that? I, mean, I think there's a lot of debate about this. I've heard one recently that it's because we, we're eating fat and fat jams up our cells and we can't get insulin into it because we have fat stuck in our cell transporters. <laughs> yes. I would imagine <laughs> that that was posited by someone who is not a fan of animal foods right. because the, the, the side door. So let me be very clear. The, the way of advocating that I have recommended throughout my career and it's not my way of eating, like I, I am simply a mouthpiece for some of the top researchers in the world. That's my, my quote unquote claim to fame is that I spent 15 years of my life reading like 1300 research studies and, and working just, you know, I, I'm an engineer. I worked at Microsoft for 10 years and I had conversations and just geeked out with top researchers like Harvard and Johns Hopkins and the Mayo Clinic and blah, 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 blah. And just recently, you know, we filmed a mini series and a feature film on location at the Harvard Medical School. And this is their research. So this is not what I think. What I think is completely irrelevant. What the science has proven is what's relevant. And what, what that shows very clearly is that there is no such thing as like fat is bad or good or protein is bad or good or carbs are bad or good or animal foods are bad or good or plants are bad or good. Those are all kind of like kindergarten level approaches to nutrition. There are objective ways to measure what food does to your body. For example, there are certain foods that calorie for calorie fill you up faster and keep you full longer. It's called satiety. And there's myriad studies showing that there are certain foods that cause a tremendous spike in release of certain hormones. And there are certain foods that don't, that are less aggressive. There are certain foods that calorie for calorie provide you with an abundance of essential nutrients. And there are certain foods that don't. And finally, 
It is a fact that there are certain macronutrients that are more efficiently stored as fat, and there are certain macronutrients that are not. So if we just focus on that, satiety, aggression, nutrition, and efficiency, or what we call SANE, there are sane plants, there are sane animals. You can have a sane keto diet, you can have an insane keto diet, you can have a sane vegan diet, you can have an insane vegan diet. So I would encourage, you know, instead of, of, of turning nutrition into a religious debate, which sometimes is what it happens, like there are facts, like it is a fact that sugar causes blank hormonal response. I wish we could all, you know, like, let's all just get along and say, why don't we focus on the most satisfying, nutritionally healthy, or excuse me, hormonally healthy, nutritionally dense foods on the planet. And if you don't like eating animals because you think it's bad for the environment or you think it's inhumane, cool. And if you don't have that belief, that's fine too. But let's eat satisfying, nutrient dense, hormonally healthy foods. Okay, so people who don't know what the concept of you eat something and it affects your hormones, um, and maybe a little bit about kind of high level how that would work. Um, what is that? What, I mean, what, what's going on here? What do you mean? What do you mean something I eat affects my hormones? <laughs> For example, if you eat something that is extremely high in processed starch or sugar, just as as a one example, that that's going to spike the level of the hormone insulin. Versus if you eat something that is very high in protein, that will spike the level of not as high, but like hormone glucagon. And there are different foods which will cause the release of different hormones because your body, for example, when you consume sugar, needs to release the hormone insulin to get that sugar into your cells. Otherwise, you will die from blood sugar poisoning because if you get too much sugar in your blood, it becomes toxic. And the only way to get that sugar out of your blood is to get it into your cells or out via your urine. And the way it gets into your cells is through the hormone insulin. So food matters for your hormones, obviously. Um, you, you've started doing a lot more work now and, and have a book coming out soon about set points. And I think that people have a lot of misconceptions on what that means and, and maybe some stigma around it of... Oh, my body, like, I'm just, this is, where, this is where I'm at, and it's fate, and I have nothing to do about this, and this is where my body is. Um, what, what are your thoughts about that? The new book is called The Set Point Diet, and what it explores is what I think is the most revolutionary and empowering, not disempowering, but empowering fact that we've seen around human biology, because a lot of us have had the experience you mentioned. We felt for decades that our body, no matter what diet we try, no matter what exercise routine, no matter what pill, potion, or powder we take, it's like our body wants to be a certain weight. And what the science is now proving is we're not crazy, we're not lazy, we're not imagining things that, you know, just like your body wants to maintain a certain temperature, and if you get into a hot room, it will take steps to cool you off, you'll sweat. Or if you go into a cold room, it'll take rooms to heat you up, you'll shiver. Or if you drink more water, you'll automatically go to the bathroom more. Or even if you know you do things to elevate blood sugar, your body will automatically try to reduce your blood sugar. It's gonna try to keep you in balance. The same thing applies to your weight. Your body will try its best to keep you at what it thinks is the optimal level of body fat for you. And that's not like, oh, there's this, you know, little person in your body that's like counting calories for you. But we, I mean, it is a fact that key life sustaining functions in your body are homeostatically regulated, meaning that your body will automatically take steps to keep them within a range much like a thermostat in your house. And we know this now. It's like this, this, this was a concept, this was a theory in the 1980s. In fact, in 1983, there was a book called The Set Point Diet published, but you can't copyright titles. So we're publishing a book called The Set Point Diet now here in 2018. And that was a theory back then. But now with all the discoveries around, for example, the hormone leptin and neurological inflammation and the impact of your gut flora on your weight, we know that your body, your brain, your gut, and your hormones all interact to fight to keep you at a certain level of body fatness, and you can starve yourself and exercise all day, but until you change what your brain, gut, and hormones are fighting 
to keep you at in terms of body fat percentage, you will, you will always be struggling against a losing battle. So everyone has an internal thermostat, but what you're saying is that you can change it. It is modifiable. That is exactly right. And some people say, if I had a set point, I mean, this is again, you could, there's people that get fired up about this. They're like, this is crazy. You, I mean, <laughs> obviously if a set point existed, you couldn't have obesity, right? Because if your body it automatically balances itself out, how could you ever be obese? But that is a bit like saying, my house is very warm. Therefore, thermostats must not exist. No, that doesn't make any sense. It means your thermostat's broken. Right. It doesn't mean the thermostat doesn't exist. So obesity exists because your body, your set point, your brain, your gut, and your hormones, your brain can become inflamed, and we can talk about the exact type of inflammation. Your hormones can become dysregulated, and your gut microbiota can get – uh, you know, skewed in one direction or the other. And your body simply says like, I don't know what the heck is going on. I think you should store a hundred excess pounds of fat on your body. And that's a disease, right? That's just like hypertension. I mean, who is, is someone going to argue that your body doesn't have a blood pressure and blood sugar set point? No, of course there's a fixed finite range in which blood pressure needs to exist for human thriving but that doesn't mean it can't become dysregulated. In fact, there's a name for that. It's called hypertension. The dysregulation of the homeostatic system around blood pressure is called hypertension. The dysregulation of the homeostatic system around blood sugar is called diabetes. And the dysregulation of the homeostatic system around body weight is called obesity. They are all diseases. And that is not my opinion. That is what the American Medical Association says. Yeah. And so you've been talking a lot about, obviously, there's way larger problems around fat, fat accumulation, fat loss, set points around that. Could this also apply and does this apply to people who, for instance, eat as much as they can possibly bear and can't put on weight or can't gain muscle or, don't, or, or can't go in that direction? A hundred percent. So that, that's actually just a quick personal, that's how that is. So how did I arrive at where I am today? So when I was growing up, I wanted to be a professional athlete and I, I, I was just, I became a personal trainer. I was literally eating 6,000 calories per day. I was like doing double shots of olive oil, trying to gain weight and I couldn't. And I was a personal trainer and I would be sitting across the table from my clients who I'm like 18, 19, 20. These are individuals who are just incredible people. I mean, they're, they're parents, they're doctors, lawyers, they're brilliant people. And I am putting them on 1200 calorie diets and they're exercising more than I am. And I am trying to wrap my head around how I, a homo sapien and they, a homo sapien, we are the same species. I am eating five times more calories than them, cannot gain weight. They're eating five times fewer calories than me and exercising more and can't lose weight. What is going on? Like what causes a naturally thin person to be naturally thin and can people who are not as fortunate cause their bodies to work more like that? And that is what inspired that 15 year research journey. And the answer is set point. I have a lower set point. In fact, my daughter, uh, we just had a, our first child and you know, she struggled. We had to go out of our way to get her to gain weight. She was not gaining weight fast enough. So she has a low set point. So even in babies, you see this. Got it. And so is the approach for changing set points, say for somebody who has a low set point, who maybe wants to add muscle mass or gain weight and can't versus somebody who has a high set point and has a lot of, of body fat that they would like to lose. Are these the same strategies or are they different strategies per, per the individual? I would say they'd be different strategies because I don't know if anyone would ever like there are ways to elevate to be clear uh, from a from a rudimentary perspective we could say you know how do you lower your set point well the way you lower your set point is you eat non-starchy vegetables nutrient dense protein whole food fats and low fructose fruits in that order and you engage in certain forms of high quality resistance training and you do you know so you eat so much of that high quality food that you're too full for processed sugar and starch so, you know, if we just inverted that logic and said, well, if you're a naturally thin person, you want to, you want to, you know, get uh, more mass on your body, just eat a whole lot of sugar, 
a whole lot of white bread and all the trans fats you can get your hands on. And without question, that would elevate your set point. You would gain body fat, but you would also develop diabetes and be killing yourself. So I wouldn't recommend against, I wouldn't recommend that. I would recommend, you know, working within what uh, your set point allows, like to be very clear, uh, most people, or not most people, many people have heard of like three basic body types, right? Ectomorph, mesomorph, endomorph. Where endomorph is a little bit more kind of beefy by nature. Mesomorph is in the middle and ectomorph is gonna be a bit tall and lankier by nature. There is nothing an ectomorph can do to become an endomorph, period. There is nothing an endomorph can do to become an ectomorph, period. But that doesn't mean we can't optimize what we've been given. Another way to think about this is, if you think about a football team, American football, uh, not not soccer or European, is if you think about the linemen, so the people, the, the kind of big stocky guys versus wide receivers, so the kind of tall lanky guys, it doesn't matter how little the lineman eats or how much he exercises or the same thing for the wide receiver. They have fundamentally different body types. Neither one is good or bad. They just are. And we can optimize that set point range for each of those people, but they can't fundamentally change their body type, if that makes sense. Right. Totally makes sense. Um, and so – if we go back to the food selection in order that you rattle off, which I think is super helpful, obviously. But yeah, let's go through that kind of one by one in, in the order that you mentioned it before. So the first and most important food group or what should make up 50% of your plate or the bulk of what you put into your mouth should be non-starchy vegetables. And non-starchy vegetables are vegetables you could you don't have to. It's really important. You don't have to, but you could eat raw. And that's an important mm. distinction because a lot of people are like, oh, I got my corn and potatoes. I got my vegetables. Those are not vegetables. Those are starches. And just a good rule of thumb is if it can't be eaten raw, it, it's not a non-starchy vegetable. Man, so how, how the hell did I not hear of that before? This is like, I've, I've been thinking of coming up to the paradigm to, to tell people about what vegetables to eat, basically non-starchy vegetables. And I've never heard that. And I, I've never thought about that. And it is the simplest thing that I am now stealing and running with. Um, so yeah, thank you. That that is incredible. And I think that's like I, I'm always on the lookout for 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 things like that. And yeah, that is the easiest possible way to tell somebody what they can kind of eat for for a vegetable. My pleasure. Well, and if you want to take it even further, you could just say the you know as a general rule of thumb, if a plant could be eaten raw, it's probably going to lower your set point. And if a plant can't be eaten raw, it's probably going to elevate your set mm, point because that then covers grains as well. Hmm. Yeah. It's fantastic. Anyway. And it sort of makes sense, right? Because cooking and heating and da, 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 da. These are, well, it sounds odd, but they are relatively modern. And it's sort of like saying, Hey, you know, wheat, I don't want to turn this into a wheat podcast, but Wheat is, you can't just take wheat and eat it. That doesn't, that's like saying, I'm just going to pick grass and eat it. Your body cannot do that. A bunch of stuff has to be, break it down, process it, heat it, do all this crazy stuff to it. And then your body really still can't process it. I mean, there's a reason, you know, goats can eat aluminum and, and do stuff with it. Human beings can't. So the, the more that 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 we have to intervene with a substance before we can put it into our body though that's that's a, a kind of a red flag right like that which is supposed to be in your body should probably just make sense be like hey there it is in nature i'm going to grab it put it in my mouth and be cool so <laughs> you know that's when when people also are like oh, animals bad well, gee, you know, if animals were toxic, we probably wouldn't have teeth <laughs> and all these other things, which are clearly part of like the fundamental human makeup. Right. If something, you know, anyway, so I digress. But if you could eat it raw, that's a good sign that for the human vegetables. body is, is there. Right. Anyway, for vegetables. Okay. 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 Non starchy vegetables. I digress. Uh, then nutrient dense protein is second most 
important. So this is like a third of your plate. And when we say nutrient dense protein, I'm, I'm actually going to to slip in and, and ask. Okay, we have this general rule of thumb. It's great for vegetables. Do you pri- prioritize any certain non starchy vegetables over any other ones? As far as get more spinach and less this, or any sort of you know get more color in, in rather than not, or is it just kind of like variety is best? It's well, it's definitely not variety is best. There is a a, a hierarchy. And one of the things that we're most excited about in the set point diet book is like in the first book, the calorie myth, we talked about these four food groups, non starchy vegetables, nutrient dense protein, whole food fats, low fructose fruits. But we've since you know, worked with tens of thousands of people and actually implementing this and seeing the most profound therapeutic results. And we found both from that and also just from the clinical research that there are optimal non starchy vegetables, optimal nutrient dense protein, optimal whole food fats and optimal low fructose fruits. And we can talk about those, but as a general of general of thumb, optimal non-starchy vegetables are deep green leafy vegetables. Got it. So now that does not mean, just to be clear, because I know your your listeners are are quite savvy, eating 12 servings of spinach is not as good for you as eating three servings of spinach and then nine servings of other non-starchy vegetables. But as a general rule of thumb, like if you can eat a giant, if you're only going to eat one vegetable today, kale would do more good for you than carrots. Got it. Okay. Good enough. Moving on to high quality proteins. So yeah, so nutrient dense proteins. And the reason okay. I say specifically nutrient dense protein versus high quality is, for example, someone could say that, you know, I got this from the farmer's market. Therefore, it's high quality. Or I bought this at Whole Foods. Therefore, it's high quality. Or this is organic. Therefore, it's high quality. So we have to like, you know, back in the day, low fat used to be the term, which the halo effect, everything that's low fat is good for you. Now it's, you know, it was expensive. So (laughs) therefore, it's good for you. Or I bought it at the farmer's market. Therefore, it's good for you. So nutrient dense protein is a food that gets the majority of its calories from protein and it contains essential vitamins and minerals. So a perfect example of this, it's not super sexy, are mollusks. So things like oysters and clams, not sexy, but extremely nutrient dense. I mean, people, I love me some vegetables, don't get me wrong, but oysters, they are like, Whew, so many hard to find nutrients plus just packed with protein. It's fantastic. Okay. So what's next up on that spectrum? So we're looking at mollusks and then from an optimal nutrient dense protein perspective, things like organ meats and fatty fish. So things like salmon. And then of course, like liver, heart, brains, all that delicious stuff. They're just extremely nutrient dense. And then normal nutrient dense proteins, which to be clear, optimal versus normal, you're still going to experience tremendous results with normal nutrient dense protein. But normal nutrient dense protein are going to be things like uh, grass fed meats or lean conventional meats, uh, almost all forms of seafood, ideally wild caught. And then other things like various protein powders that are low in sugar, certain dairy products that are, again, low in sugar, and um, egg whites, which, you know, like, look, I'm just saying egg whites because a whole egg is 64% fat. So we categorize whole eggs as whole food fats. Uh, But an egg white is like 91% protein. So it is a nutrient dense protein. It doesn't mean that whole eggs are bad. It just means they're a good source of fat, not protein. What are your thoughts on protein powders in general? You you mentioned that. Just curious about your stance on on some of these. I think, for example, for vegans, they are life saving. Got it. So you know, for if I'm if you're a vegan and you are trying to lower your set point and you are trying to live what we would consider a sane lifestyle, you have to eat low sugar, all natural pea rice or hemp protein, period. Because you you cannot get enough protein. Beans are not a nutrient-dense source of protein. They're 70 to 80% carbs. So if you're trying to get 100 grams of protein from beans, 
you're going to make your stomach explode. I mean, it just, it, it can't happen. They don't have enough protein in them. So as a general rule of thumb, whole foods are always best. There are things, I mean, there are, you know, pea protein has some tremendous benefits to it. It is without question, grass fed, unflavored, just pure whey protein concentrate. And if you look at the you know, immunoglobulins in it, if you look at the concentration of glutathione, if you look at how it's been used in burn victims, it's a powerful substance. Uh, so you're, you're a fan of whey. We're actually um, developing a whey product. And even people on the team, when I announce this, because it's something that I've used for a long period of time, they go, wait, isn't whey bad for you? And I think it, like it's, it's starting to almost have this stigma of being an unhealthy food because I think we had this phase over the last maybe five, 10 years of people, I don't know, getting into paleo or not and saying that dairy and all dairy is bad for everybody uh, permanently. And then that means that whey comes from dairy. So whey is dairy and that you're going to die if you have whey. That's kind of like the, the thought process that I think a lot of people have. Um, so glad that you're on camp, camp whey for the, the, the reasons that you mentioned. Um, immunoglobins, glutathione concentration, the quality of the protein. I know that's not one of your things, but high nutrient density. Uh, but yeah, I mean, so th that's something that I think there's been a lot of miseducation and misinformation around lately. And I think we also have to look at how it's being used. And I mean, you know, for example, there's a reason that people in the fitness community, especially like bodybuilders, have used whey protein for a very long time. Whey protein is extremely high in the amino acid leucine. And we've seen tremendous research around how leucine has an impact on muscle protein synthesis. And so, you know, would I recommend drinking, you know, whey protein hydrosylate? right before you go to bed? Absolutely not. No, I would not recommend that. Can whey protein concentrate be used in certain context? And would I argue that it is the, would be superior to any other form of protein in those contexts? Yes. And I think that's a good way to just generally see if something is the truth or not. I know we live in like, you know, clickbait world now, but when people say things like all dairy is bad, that is a red flag. Right. Like there probably there are higher quality sources of dairy and low quality sources of that's like being like, you know, all conservatives are bad or all <laughs> liberals are going to jail. Ah, like all that kind of talk, you know, it's, it's fun and it gets clicks, but it's just not true. Right. Cool. So that makes a lot of sense. And you said some sources of protein with, with dairy. Um, what are the sources that you like there? And just to avoid flames, uh, flame mail, I'm going to say lower fat and lower sugar forms of dairy only because we're talking about nutrient dense protein right now. So if I have, for example, cottage cheese that is full fat and I have cottage cheese that is fat free, by definition, the fat free cottage cheese has a higher percent of its calories coming from protein. Mm. So, so that, that like what I just said is a mathematical fact. It's not debatable. So I'm not saying that whole fat Greek yogurt is bad. I'm not saying that full fat uh, cottage cheese is bad. I am saying that if your goal is to eat 30 grams of protein, you're going to take in a bunch more calories from fat accidentally, quote unquote, if you're using full fat Greek yogurt, than if you were using fat free Greek yogurt. So again, it's goal specific. If you're like, Hey, I just worked out and I want to get in 30 grams of protein. Cause I've read in Jonathan's work that that has, you know, profound impact impact on your metabolism. You're looking for nutrient dense protein. You're looking at concentrated sources of protein. So by definition, leaner sources of protein, again, by definition mm. have to have a higher percentage of their calories from protein. So fat-free or 2% fat, Greek yogurt with no sugar or flavorings, fat-free or 2%, uh, cottage cheese are going to get more of their calories from protein than any other source and fit within this category. Good distinction. And thank you for the disclaimer. You probably would have gotten a lot of hate mail if, if not. <laughs> All right. And then the next one, which... All right. So whole food fats. Yeah. And this is where this is where we can celebrate certain full fat dairy. This is where we can celebrate eggs. This is where we can celebrate nuts and seeds because a, a, a whole food fat is simply a whole food that gets more of its calories from fat than anything else. 
So eggs, 64% of their calories are coming from fat. Eggs are one of the most optimal, incredible whole food fat sources in the world. Full fat Greek yogurt. Most of its calories come from fat, wonderful whole food fat. Full fat kefir, full fat low sugar dairy. These are whole food sources of fat. Nuts and seeds, fantastic whole food sources of fat. There are optimal ones, optimal whole food sources of fat are going to be high in especially therapeutic forms of fat, such as omega-3 fats, monounsaturated fats, and medium-chain triglycerides. So things like coconut for medium-chain triglycerides, things like uh, uh, fatty fish, or again, this isn't a whole food, I get that, but like cod liver oil, or if you're in plant realm, chia seeds and flax seeds for omega-3s, and from a monounsaturated fat perspective, olives, avocados, and macadamia nuts. Got it. And so next one, low fructose fruits. Most fruits are not going to do our metabolism any favor because they have been so hybridized and so destroyed by the modern food system. You know, modern grapes, if you took them and squeezed them and put them in a glass and put eight ounces of grape juice next to eight ounces of Coca-Cola, it is a mathematical fact that the eight ounces of grape juice contains 50% more sugar than the Coca-Cola. And I know as people say, well, that's got vitamins in it. If you put a vitamin <laughs> pill in the Coca-Cola, it doesn't make it good for you. Right. Right. So what we want to look at is low fructose fruits. So fruits that provide you with the most essential vitamins, minerals, blah, blah, with the least amount of sugar. So these are going to be things like berries and citrus fruits. What about kiwis? I don't know off the top of my head yeah. the ratio. Yeah, one of my friends working on this app called uh, Trish, Trish.io, and he basically looked at all fruit, in, including correcting for fruit dust, and kiwis cr- across the board are the most nutrient-dense fruit in, in his evaluation. It was pretty fascinating. I was blown away by that. Well, I, and I do have to say that when I was younger, I actually, I don't know why I have this memory. I have a memory, I think it was probably like 14 or 15, and I got done with football practice, and I came home, and my mom had kiwis, and I just a like six kiwis. I was just like, nom, 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 because they're so good. <laughs> right. It'd be something to do it. Um, one of the things about, um, like you said, the hybridiz- hybridization of foods. And I told the story in a few podcasts before and I was talking about results of my continuous blood glucose monitor. I was, my girlfriend brought upstairs some snacks and it was like some macadamia nuts some berries and the fourth of an apple. And I just was eating through the, the apple. I ate through it and I was reading or doing something else and kind of distracted. Didn't really eat anything else of that at that time. And within 13 minutes or so, 14, 15 minutes, my phone sounded like a nuclear bomb was about to hit us, like some warning sign. And I was like, what the hell is this? And I had a week before when I installed the continuous blood glucose monitor, I put on an alert. If my blood sugar went over, I think it was 175 to alert me. And so it did the first time from one fourth of one apple. So in, in Apple, I mean, I think this is, I mean, the, the worst of them, a honey crisp which are delicious, but in no way is this what an apple should be. And if one-fourth of an apple jacks me up that much, that's the only thing that, that got my blood sugar that high. Uh, like I've been doing tests the last three, four weeks. Other than um, these um, candies, that people can t- take me with these smart sweets that literally broke my meter um, and b- didn't allow it to read anymore, but you know, it's only, only one gram of sugar per packet. So, <laughs> Jeez. Um, yeah. so yeah. So berries, obviously, amazing, and citrus fruits. Um, any anything else that that fall into? That? Obviously, we're maybe maybe I don't know if kiwis are considered citrus. Probably not. Some of the big seeds, but and then there are I mean, within the optimal categories. You know, one of some of my favorites. There are these more exotic fruits, uh, and like before I get into the exotic ones, like lemons are super underappreciated. Uh, lemons are incredibly good for you. There's one gram of sugar per, per whole lemon. It has profound impacts on uh, alkalinity within your body. It helps with a bunch of other things. I love using them in green smoothies. It's shocking. You know, when you talk to people about making green smoothies, you know, so many of the modern green smoothies are worse for you again than soda because you go to Jamba Juice and you buy this thing that has 70 grams of sugar in it. It's poison, but you can make your own green smoothies and you don't have to saturate them with sugar because lemon and other sort of very acidic substances like raw undistilled apple cider vinegar, if you want to put spinach and kale and romaine lettuce when it's not toxic because romaine lettuce has been having some problems recently in a blender, 
you can cut that bitterness with a strong acid like a lemon or raw undistilled apple yeah. cider vinegar, make it taste good and make it tremendously helpful for you. Got it. So we talked about all this stuff. You said 50% of the plate from tier one of these non-starchy vegetables. What are the amounts that people want to shoot for for the other three categories? As a general serving recommendation, we say, you know, as much as possible, you're looking for double digit servings of non-starchy vegetables per day. And it's like, how do you do that? Well, if you eat three at each meal, you're already at nine. So you're pretty close. And a serving is quite small. People, you know, a carrot is a serving of non-starchy vegetables. So you're looking for double digit servings of non-starchy vegetables. You're looking for three to six servings of nutrient dense protein, uh, two to six servings of whole food fats, and zero to two servings of low fructose fruits. And the way we define servings are always relative to your hand because you certainly can't say that like a five-year-old has the same serving size as a NFL linebacker. So for those serving sizes, non-starchy vegetables, a serving is if they're leafy and poofy, a serving is generally what you can hold kind of in two hands. If you cook it down and it shrinks, it's, you know, a serving fits easily within the palm of your hand. A serving of nutrient dense protein is about the size of the palm of your hand. Serving of whole food fats is generally about 150 calories or your pointer finger and your index finger put together. And then a low fructose fruit is, is generally about the size of your palm. Got it. Some easy, easy to understand rules. Um, yeah, that I think that is probably the the only thing that people need to know <laughs> for, as far as nutrition. I, and I've I've kind of used some of these rules of you know hands, thumbs, things like that. Um, but yeah, yeah, that, I mean that breakdown I think could solve a lot of problems for people. And I think that yeah, you can skew it and you can get in the weeds. But people who just are so confused and apprehensive to get started, this is such an easy paradigm to follow. A hundred percent. And if we can help the the current generation, the new generation, I mean, my mother's generation, the baby boomer generation, I mean, they were so misled for so long. It's like, don't resistance train. It's bad for you. And sugar isn't is good for you. And fat is bad for you. And you need to count calories. And if we can, if we can, you know, look, your body is not broken by default. It's not stupid. It's beautiful. And it automatically wants to keep you healthy as long as you feed it non-starchy vegetables, nutrient-dense protein, whole food fats, and low fructose fruits in that order. And by the way, resistance training is freaking super good for you. Like there is no diabetes epidemic, period. It's that simple. Right. Simple, but not. Uh, so if you want to learn more, uh, Jonathan, where, they, where can they find more information about this book, The Set Point Diet, and more information about you? Please go to sane, S-A-N-E, solution.com. Again, that's sane, solution.com. Great. All right, that, Jonathan, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Keto Answers Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. But even if you didn't, I would love a review. Just go over to iTunes, wherever you listen to your podcast, and pop in a review so we can get found by more people, get better guests, and have the information that you need. So please go to iTunes, wherever you listen to your podcast, and leave us a review. And if you're new to keto, head on over to perfectketo.com slash podcast and enter your email for all our top tips and guides on getting started with the ketogenic diet. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.